Hey, uh, Pastor Brian, uh, my dad texted me just right before I came up, and he said he heard that comment about uh, telling him that he's long, he's listening online right now, so he's got some words, he'll, he'll expect you in his office first thing tomorrow morning, is, <laughs> that's what I'm, I'm believing, so. Well, good evening, everybody, how's everybody doing? You know, uh, Hawkins told me to keep it short tonight. And so I will keep it short tonight, but the uh, funny thing is in this pulpit, we've got this um, thing, and every time he preaches, he lowers it, and then every time I preach, I have to uh, move it up because I can't see through my glasses, so I'll return here in a second when I get this to the appropriate height and not the short person height. So there we go. Now I can see my notes. <laughs> So uh, I am uh, super glad to share with you guys tonight, and um, I, I, you know, I love baptism nights. It's, it's such a great night to just celebrate uh, what the Lord has done in an individual's life, and, and um, just them coming out and saying, you know what, Jesus is, is for me, and, and he is Lord of my life, and, and I, I, just, uh, I, I just love baptisms nights. Um, so turn in your Bibles tonight to Matthew chapter 18. And I plan on keeping things short, and I really believe that God has given me this message, and I, and I pray uh, that the Holy Spirit would speak to all of us, that, that we would take time to reflect inwards and, and allow God to um, speak to us, to challenge us, uh, and maybe even direct us uh, into a, a moment of action. And, and if not um, now, I believe that this message will be um, relevant and applicable in a certain time in our life when we come across that. So Matthew chapter 18, before we get there, I'm going to briefly pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to share your words. I pray that uh, you would just speak through me tonight and that what needs to be said would be said, God. I pray that you'd speak to every heart, you'd open our ears, you'd open our hearts, God, and would you just be glorified in everything, Jesus. Um, We just invite you uh, in this place and in this service tonight, in Jesus' name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15 is where we're going to be reading tonight. But before we do, I want us to take a look at the theme of the chapter uh, of of Matthew 18. And starting in verse 1, Jesus tells this this parable um, about children and, and how we must have a childlike faith in order to be reconciled to him. And we better not cause someone to stumble because he longs for everyone to be in a relationship with uh, him. In, in verse 10, uh, the next parable that Jesus tells is, is the parable of the lost sheep and how the shepherd goes after the one lost sheep so that the sheep would be reunited with the shepherd and the flock. And there's a sense of reconciliation to both God and his church. God is longing to be in a relationship with those that are lost. And you look, skip down uh, past the passage that we're going to read, and we skip down to verse 21, and it's the parable of the unmerciful servant, and it's all about forgiveness and reconciling what was broken. And if we don't forgive others, then God won't forgive us. Jesus tells us uh, this because his will is that none perish. He wants us all to be in a right relationship with him. And so I think uh, one of, if not the most major theme of Matthew chapter 18 is this theme of uh, God wanting to be in a relationship with us. The, the work of reconciliation, the work of restoring something that was broken or that was lost and making sure, you know, and, and the, the children not, not being tripped up, not causing them to stumble, of being in that right relationship with God. So keep that theme in mind as we, we read verses 15 through 17. You can follow along on your Bibles or on the screen. If your brother sins against you, let me stop right there because um, in some translations it says if your brother or sister sins, okay? Either way, whatever the correct or the original words, the point is still the same tonight. So don't get caught up whether it's against you or just a brother or sister sins. Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now oftentimes when I've read this passage, uh, I've always had a selfish perspective 
in, in mind. It was always about me. Um, it was an apology that I expected when someone sinned against me and, and that I wanted to receive this apology and showing them they're wrong. It, it was about my relationship with that person who had wronged me and, and now I wanted my relationship with them to go back to normal and go back uh, to the way things were before they broke that relationship and they hurt me. But tonight I want us to, to realize that this passage is about restoring someone's relationship with God. Yes, when we confront someone with a, a sin, we might very well have a reconciliation of friendship, but we should be more concerned with a person's relationship with God than their relationship with us. You know, when we get to that point and we care more about someone's relationship with God than how they feel towards us, then it eliminates the fear that often comes with and the uncomfortableness that comes with confronting a sin. Um, it becomes a little easier to speak that hard truth to our children or to our brothers or to our sisters or maybe to our parents or grandchildren or the close friends we have or coworkers. And I'm gonna share some do's and do nots when it comes time to confront someone who has sinned either against you or is caught in a sin. But before I share those, this is probably the most important thing um, that hinges this whole sermon, is, is any time you confront a sin, it needs to be done out of relationship. It needs to be done out of relationship. If you have a strong relationship with a friend, that friend trusts you, and you'll start to build trust and rapport with that friend. And as that friend trusts you, there will be an opportunity for influence. Most of the time, and I stress most of the time, you will have very little to no influence over people if they don't first know that you love them and care about them. So I say that to say this. If you know of someone in the church that is sinning and is struggling in a sin, but you don't really know them, you just know about them, it's probably not your place to be the one to confront them and to show uh, the sin and help restore them. Does that make sense? Um, I, I, I don't think that um, anyone here would want um, uh, someone else not knowing them coming up and just saying this and saying this and saying this. It, it needs to be done out of love and out of relationship. And speaking truth out of love will lead to change. However, speaking truth just to speak truth can come across mean, judgmental, and plain hurtful. How many have ever been hurt by someone when being confronted about a sin or anything? Absolutely, it happens. So um, I just want to make sure that before you confront someone's sin, make sure that first, you're the right person. You have that relationship. And secondly, and more important than even than that, that God is actually calling you in that time, in that moment, with those Holy Spirit words to do so. Um, we need to allow time for the Holy Spirit to work, and there's just because you see something that's wrong doesn't necessarily mean that it's the, the right time to address it. So we have to allow God to do the convicting of the Holy Spirit, but sometimes he asks us through our times of prayer to say, hey, you know what? This person, can you go there? You've got the relationship. You love them. Help them through this. Um, so the first do of the, the do's that we see in the text is in verse 15. And, and verse 15 says this, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. So the first do is to confront the person privately. This way you can have a conversation about it. You can, you can uh, restore them gently. Uh, you can pray with the individual. Don't confront the person on Facebook. Don't, don't confront uh, the person um, in, in a public setting. How many would right now like me to uh, air out your, your sin in front of you know, everybody here tonight? I don't, I don't think that anybody would, would raise your hand uh, to that. Don't do it at the dinner table with your whole family there. You know, We need to do this in the time that God calls us and Jesus says first to do it just between the two of you. Galatians 6.1 says, if a brother is caught in sin, to restore gently, to gently restore the individual. And that is so much easier to do when it's one-on-one -on -one 
and, and it shows them and you have the opportunity to say, look, I'm, I'm doing this for your best interest. I'm doing this so that you might not sin against God again. I'm doing this um, to, to help you and, and, and to lead you in that. When done in private, it's, it's easier uh, for the person caught in sin to not become defensive. And, and when we need to confront gently and with the goal of restoring them, as this whole chapter is about restoration. The second do um, is if this person, uh, you have not won them over, they, they would not listen to you, is to bring in a witness. Verse 16 says, but if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay? So who should be the witness when you go and you confront that person? You know, should I just pull in Joe Schmo that's holier than thou? Should I, should I pull in just one of my friends? No, it, it also needs to be done out of relationship. Because if the person that is, is being confronted doesn't already know that you love them and you care for them and the person that you've brought with them loves them and cares for them, they're going to be like, whoa, what are you doing? Why are you trying to do this? And they're going to throw up their defensive walls. It's not going to be heard. And it's, it's most likely not going to go well. You need that relationship that leads to trust, that, that leads to influence. And the, the second reason I believe that, that Jesus tells us to confront with a witness of, of one or two other people is, is to um, uh, kind of create up this accountability. It's safer for you because words can't be twisted um, or misheard. How many have ever... Um, confronted someone one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's a work conflict or whatever the conflict was, and your words were like totally misheard, and what was conveyed was not what was received, and it was this he said, she said type of thing. Has anybody ever had that happen to you? Okay, If you haven't, you must not be living life, because that happens all the time. At least it, it, it seems like that. Um, you know, it can be uh, twisted and, and, and misheard. And so this, is, this creates that accountability. It creates that third witness um, saying, no, this was done properly. This was done gently. This was done um, in order to see that restoration um, come, hap come to happen. And the, the third do we see, if they still don't listen, if they still uh, don't see their fault, is in verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen to even the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Okay? The church is not the entire body. Right? The, the church is not the entire body. Who, who is the church in this instance? Who are they talking about? They're talking about someone that represents the church that um, is an overseer. Maybe it's a deacon. Maybe it's an elder. Maybe it's one of your pastors. And, and you bring them into it. And if they still don't listen, you treat them as a pagan. Now, how do you treat a pagan? How, how, how do Michael and Brooke treat a Muslim? With love. With respect. You pray for them. You witness to them. It doesn't mean that you stone them. But Jesus wouldn't um, allow someone, and, and I don't believe that the church, um, in, in treating them like a pagan, you know, if, if they still don't listen to it, you're not going to allow them to continue to teach Sunday school. You're not going to uh, allow them to oversee a discipleship group. Uh, they, they might even need to be removed from a membership because they're not um, truly following Christ wholeheartedly at, at that point. They've been confronted. So there is a, a, a point where um, they are removed from that, but that doesn't mean that you stop loving them. That doesn't mean that you start treating them uh, horribly. Uh, you treat them as you would anybody else that is lost because that's simply what it is. Tonight, um, there's a couple do nots that I, I think are, are big. And the, the first is this, is don't, don't talk to your neighbor about it. I think in the church world, we spread information kind of um, in a, um, 
in the disguise of being helpful, but maybe not always being helpful. Hey, just keep this between you and me. I'm not really supposed to say anything, but could you just be praying for for so-and-so? They asked me to be quiet, but I know that you'll pray. How many times does that get passed on to the next person, to the next, and to the next? Gossip isn't necessarily just mean talk. It's the spreading of information that doesn't need to be spread. Just because something's true doesn't mean that it's okay to share. If you're not directly a part of that solution, then you probably shouldn't be talking about that solution. If somehow you're a part of that solution, then it needs to be addressed and it needs to be taken care of. So, so just when, when we're dealing with sin, which we all deal with, don't talk to the person to the right or to the left. Go directly to it. Keep it to yourself. Take it to the Lord in prayer. The second thing, and, and uh, this is, um, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. I told you I was going to keep it short tonight, um, it, of a do not from this passage is do not turn your eye. Do not pass the responsibility. You know, uh, Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen says, "Iron sharpens just as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another man." You know, there is someone here tonight that needs you to be that person who will gently restore them. There's someone in your life tonight that maybe you're like, man, they're part of my family, they're my son, they're my daughter, they're my spouse, they're a pastor, they're whoever it is that that needs uh, to be confronted and so that they can be restored and, and so that they cannot sin against God again. You know, you can't pass the responsibility off just because it's uncomfortable. How many would say that you are not a person that is, you, you don't like to confront things, you'd rather just kind of bottle it up or you just kind of brush it under the rug? Anybody here would just say kind of like, yeah, I'm not, okay. I, I understand that, um, uh, but you know what? It is your duty and God's asking you to, at times, confront one another and sin. So as I close tonight, I want to tell uh, two stories. The first story is um, a personal, ex- both are personal experiences, um, but one has to do with me confronting someone and the other one has to do with another person confronting me. The first story is obviously I'm a college age pastor and there is a student that had been coming for several months um, and we had good relationship. Um, I was able, um, you know, to, to be his pastor. He'd come to me for different things, and there was just one or two things in his life where I felt like the Lord was saying, you know what, you need to call him out on it. You need to call this person out on it because they're just, you know, struggling with that um, dualistic, you know, just like Paul, you know, I, I don't do what I want to do and I do what I don't want to do. And so I take this, this, this kid to lunch and, um, you know, I encourage him, I build him up and I say, hey, you know what, um, I've just been seeing, you know, some unhealthy habits and I'm, I'm concerned about you and I want to challenge you today. You know, you really need to, and, and in this instance, um, you really need to, to plug into a church, you know, um, floating around, kind of coming when you're needed, kind of just doing your thing, man, you're going to continue to struggle with the things that we've talked about. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to win the war that you're, you're, you're fighting if you're not just continually plugged into a church. And, and whether that's here or it's somewhere else, man, you've just got to do it. Um, and he took it great, so I thought. You know, so we end the the lunch. I feel great about it. We pray together. Then for probably three or four months, no response to text, no response to uh, um, phone calls. I'm seeing things on Facebook that I'm like, oh man, Lord, was that just was that wrong? Was was I wrong? Was I missing you, Lord? Was I I not doing it? Um, but thankfully, um, about four or five months later. Um, he ended up getting plugged into this church 
And I don't know if it was just he needed to kind of root and just reroute just to himself, but he's been plugged in ever since, and he's serving the Lord. So it was one of those situations where I had that instant like, oh, Lord, did I miss you in this? But boy, am I so thankful that I, I took that risk of that friendship. I took that risk of saying, you know what? I care about you enough that even though you might not walk through this door again, I, I, I care about your future and I, I care about where you are headed as an individual and um, I, I'm going to confront you and, and, and restore you. The second story um, was when someone confronted me and uh, that person was Dale Atchison. And if anybody knows Dale Atchison, uh, the Atchisons and the Weavers um, have known each other a very long time. And, and uh, we speak truth to each other. And that's just the relationship that we have. And, and I'm very thankful for Dale and Jared and Donnie and, and so many others. Um, but I was about 12 years old. And uh, um, I, as middle schoolers do, often do stupid things. And I mooned a group of people, and there were some, some, some girls in, in that group, you know, and uh, I'm not proud of that. And so go ahead and judge your pastor, if you will. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it wasn't, you know, I'm, I was probably sixth or seventh grade. I just wasn't thinking clearly. Um, and you weren't thinking clearly when you were in sixth and seventh grade either, okay? Um, and, you know, so I thought it was funny and everything, and a, man, maybe Two, three weeks later, Dale was giving me a ride home for something, and man, he just pegged me, <laughs> you know. And, and, but what he did is, is he, he brought to it, he's like, look, Austin, I, I don't want you, um, you know, and he, he showed me my future. He, I, I, don't, I don't want this to, to cause some sort of issue. What would have happened if this, you know, what, you know, and, and you just, you have to think about what you're doing. And he took that moment, and he confronted, you know, a, a sin, um, and, and, and he, he made it a, a learning opportunity. And man, uh, there's been other times, you know, in my life where I've done things um, and, and uh, had someone point it out. And it's just a, a great uh, learning experience. And, and so I'm so thankful for friends like the Atchisons that speak truth into my life. Um, and, and I hope that tonight you realize that you can't just be someone that has friends like that, that you have to be that friend to somebody else. You can't expect to have someone to push you on in your faith if you aren't willing to push someone else on in their faith, right? Would the musicians come, and, and as you come, I'm just going to ask you guys to just close your eyes, um, tune out any distractions, and this is a little bit different of a sermon. Um, I, I know it is, um, but I want God to, to, to speak to you. So just close your eyes, tune out the distractions, put away your phone, and I want you to allow God to speak to you tonight. Is there somebody in your life that has sinned against you or that is caught in a sin? Is there somebody that you know is doing something that is affecting their relationship with God? That is causing them to stray away like a, a, a potential lost sheep? Now, many of you, and I would, I would assume that most of you probably know someone that you have a good relationship, that, that you have trust with, that you have influence with, and, and God is laying this, you know what? You need to stop being that silent friend. You need to be the friend that speaks truth. And now I want you to, to pray and ask God, is, God, are you asking me to do something about it? And if so, God, would you reveal in the way and, and, and what time, how I'm supposed to do it, God? Would you give me the faith? I've never done anything like this before, God, but I, I know that you want me to, to, to push others towards you, God. I know that you're asking me to do this, so just reveal your plan for me, God. Show me how to confront them. Give me the words. Give me the faith to, to risk that relationship, to, to risk that friendship, to pen, potentially lose somebody from my life so that maybe they wouldn't lose their relationship or their life with you, God. Continue just to, to pray, and I believe that God is, is, is going to 
speak to you tonight of what he wants you to do and how he wants you to handle it. Let's just take a moment to hear from the Lord. for everyone here tonight. I pray that we would be obedient to you, God. Your word says that those who know what they ought to do, yet they do not do it, they sin, Lord. And so, God, tonight, as you have called many of us to be iron, to sharpen a friend, to, to, to guide a friend, to correct and restore gently in love a friend, God, I pray that you'd give us the boldness and the courage to do so, God, that we would love their soul more than we love our friendship with them, Jesus. I pray that that relationships would be restored, Lord. I pray that if we ourselves would to be confronted with something in our life, God, that we would not throw up defensive walls, but that we would be receptive, God, that we would see that person's heart and that we would know that they have their our best interest in mind, God. I pray that 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 we would just begin to purge ourselves of the sin that we allow so comfortably in the church, Jesus. Would you purify your church, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, God? Would we become intolerant of it, Jesus? much for the mercy and the forgiveness that you've extended to us, God. We thank you that your love never fails, never runs out, never gives up on us, God. It goes on and on and on and on, Jesus. And I just pray that as we confront those or we are confronted, God, that we would be reminded of that simple truth that we'd be reminded that you will always be a God who loves us. But God, may we not trample the blood of Jesus Christ. May we, we take your word serious. May we, we remove the things in our lives that cause us to sin. Remove the opportunities that cause us to sin, Lord. And by your spirit and by your strength, not of what we can do, God, but empower your people by your Holy Spirit to do that, God. We love you and we praise you. And we thank you, God. Speak to your people tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us tonight? We're going to sing this song, but here's the last thing that I, I, I want to challenge you guys with. Is if God has spoke something to your life or into your heart tonight and, and you said, you know what? I see this in my son. I see this in my daughter. I see this in a relationship. I see this in someone that I care about, a coworker, a friend, someone and, and God has spoke that to you and you feel that God is asking you to be iron. Even though it's uncomfortable for you, you need to obey that. And so tonight, before you leave, send a message to someone and say, hey, let's grab lunch. I need to talk. Maybe you need to step out in the foyer and call that individual and say, you know what, we need to get together. Maybe they're in this room and you just need to pull them aside and, and you guys just have that prayer and that moment of restoration together tonight, okay? Be a people of action. Be a people responsive of the Holy Spirit.